You can manipulate reality. If you go into a state of subjectivity where the difference between subjective and objective completely dissolves. There's like an external world, there's a subjective internal world. They are interacting in some deep way. Science knows a lot about the external. We know very, very little about the internal. Go to the East then, you say, well, they know a lot about the internal world. And surprisingly, what they say is you go deep enough, you end up in the external world. They're the same at some level, which is what all the esoteric traditions say, where the idea of magic comes from in the first place. Today, science, even today's philosophy to a large extent, and certainly at an everyday level of awareness, that sounds crazy, but that's where the evidence is pointing. Somehow, reality is composed of mind and matter at the same time, and they are interacting all the time. Elementary forms of telepathy and clairvoyance and precognition, some psychokinetic stuff. We know that's real because we can do the tests in the laboratory and others can repeat it and then we publish our results and this has been going on for over 100 years. There's the cautionary tale there. We're working with something that's quite real and if we don't know what we're doing you have to be very careful with it. All of these studies begin with experiences that people report and the labels that we give to them are a way of talking about those experiences. Uh, so a word like telepathy is a catch-all phrase, meaning that what one person is thinking or experiencing another person at a distance will have similar thoughts, usually around the same time, or similar experiences. So a wide range of telepathic-like experiences, some of which are conscious and some are unconscious, like looking at correlations in physiology between two people who are separated. The whole body itself can correlate between people at a distance. Mm -hmm. So that's telepathy. Clairvoyance is the ability to perceive that is not bound by space or time. So when it's not bound by space, it means that you're able to either see something that is hidden or something at a far distance that you can't literally see with your ordinary senses. And the transcending time element is labeled precognition or retrocognition. So if you perceive something that hasn't happened yet in the objective world, it's precognition. And that too can be conscious or unconscious. And if it's something that happened in the past, it would be retrocognition. And that too can also be conscious or unconscious. If you're remembering something, that's memory. Mm -hmm. If you're perceiving something that you were not aware of before, like the, the reports of people, for example, going someplace and then suddenly having a very strong memory of something that happened there, the people that, that were being perceived at the time were in period costumes that were clearly a century ago. So like just an experience that comes out of nowhere. So those are three categories. The fourth category is psychokinetic effects, sometimes also called telekinetic. And it's the idea that mind and matter interact directly. In each one of these classes, there's between a half a dozen to a dozen different kinds of ways that these phenomena can manifest and an equal number of ways that they've been tested in the laboratory. So. We know pretty much across the board that there's a wide range in which you can think of this as uh, ways in which information flows in the body and out of the body, or in the mind and out of the mind. So if information is flowing in, well, this is telepathy and clairvoyance and precognition. It's we're somehow getting information from the world. If we're pushing information back out, then we can think of it as a psychokinetic effect. And the reason I say that is because the way that psychokinesis is generally portrayed is things like bolts of lightning shooting out of your hands. It's like force getting pushed out. And we have never found any evidence that that is in fact what's happening. It looks much more like what's happening is that information is being exchanged. This is relatively recent within science of thinking about forces and fields and those kinds of concepts, which make a lot of sense in classical physics. Once you get beyond that into quantum uh, phenomena, we're not dealing with force anymore or energy in the usual sense. We're dealing more with the way that we describe how things are, which is informational. Any kind of ritual will focus your mind. If you are working with a number of other people and you are coherent with each other, like you're, each person is thinking along the same lines and not one of them is really a secret super skeptic who thinks it's all nonsense, mm. you really do have to be in alignment. But if that alignment occurs, then there's some evidence that the larger the group, up to some size, it's not entirely clear what the size is between seven and nine people, something like that. Up to that point, it seems to compound that whatever the intention is, it gets stronger somehow. Mm.
We know from a lot of laboratory studies that one person and one physical object, usually a random number generator, that one person's intention and attention will change the probabilistic output of the generator. So it's a mind-matter interaction at a very subtle scale, but nevertheless, we see it happen. Here's an example. This is a very fancy one that's based on uh, the direction that a photon, a single photon of light, will go either directly through a half-silvered mirror or bounce off. And the decision of what the photon is doing is considered to be fundamentally random, meaning no cause at all. Well, Einstein didn't like that idea. He, that's why he said God doesn't play dice with the universe. He figured there must be some cause, but the prevailing idea in quantum mechanics is that there's no cause at all. So you take devices like this that produce sequences of random events, zeros and ones, that are unpredictable by any means. And so these are convenient to use in the laboratory because it's easy to collect the data on a computer. And then you assign somebody a task where they're looking at a graph on a screen or looking some kind of feedback to produce more ones or produce more zeros. People can do that. Not everyone can do it to the same extent, but this, this lot of data has shown that this in general happens. So you can think of this in as our intention is pushing the probabilities of the world around. How it does that, we don't know, but that's what happens. So a lot of the studies that have been done then in looking at this is first of all, to verify that it actually occurs. The second is to try to begin to piece apart what are the criteria, or what are the processes involved in, in making it happen. So we look at things like personality and physiology of the person, various different kinds of random number generators, other kinds of physical targets that have some degree of randomness in them because everything physical does. And a very, very broad range of targets then have been used as objects of intention. As best as I can tell, anything that is measurable, like if you take, like most things you can measure something about it, but if you take something like a rock or just a hunk of metal, it, it's difficult to know what are you gonna measure on that. And those are generally not used as targets, but anything that is labile, that is living or is moving in some way, many have been used as targets and virtually all of them show similar effects. So you. You have intention aimed at something, the something will change, usually in quite a subtle way, but in a measurable way. Yeah. And and for people that want this like one, two, three step process of performing magic, what would you tell someone that, you know, they have something in their life that they want to create, whether that's a relationship, whether that's a new job opportunity, whatever it is, more abundance in their life, what would be a magical ritual that you would uh, offer for people to maybe explore or that they can do uh, and maybe some precautions as well yeah so one of the easiest ways is a sigil mm -hmm. so a sigil is a word that means symbol and you think of a phrase that encapsulates what it is that you want you take the the first letter and you write those letters down and then you move them around to create a shape mm -hmm. uh, some kind of symbol that stands for your intention. There's lots of different things you can do. You could create that picture. So if I if I wanted to manifest a conversation with Dean Radin, would this be a yeah. good example? And so that you can even you can find uh, apps on phones where you type in something and it'll create a sigil for you. Mm. I, I don't recommend that as much as actually taking the effort to to do it yourself because and to be creative about how it looks and it. For some people, they like it to look uh, uh, pleasant to look at or meaningful in some way because you're using your intention in the process of doing that. So once you create the sigil, there's several things you can do. One approach is to make copies of it and paste them all over the place so that you're, you're constantly reminded of, yeah. that, that you made this thing. Get it into your subconscious. Yeah. Yeah, like put it on your mirror that you see in the morning, things like that, so you're reminded of this. The conscious part of it is creating the sigil itself and so-called charging the, sig the sigil with that intention. And you don't want to dwell on it too much because this is none of this happens through your conscious awareness. It happens once it becomes really deep into your unconscious. So you spend a fair amount of time making the sigil, thinking about it, and then you set it aside. I mean, it still could be up on your mirror, but you're not looking at your mirror all day long. So you, you don't dwell on it. You set it out there and just let it go. You also don't need to think about how your intention will manifest, right? 
I'll give an example here if I can find it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so one of the examples I give is uh, you have an intention to get a gold-plated Mercedes. And so you don't care how that happens. You just want it to show up in your in your driveway and you are the owner of this gold-plated Mercedes. Well, if you think, if you start thinking about what needs to happen in the real world for that to occur, y- you'll stop yourself immediately. Yeah. That's That's what so, we would call like the linear thinking. Well, it's not only mind. linear thinking, but it, it's, it's self-questioning. You in, in, inject doubt into yeah. the intention, and that destroys the intention. So you need to intend this and say, "Look, I don't care how this is going to happen. I just want this to happen." You know, universe, you figure it out somehow, and it may work tomorrow. May wait, may ten years to have it happen, but it's, it'll happen. When you have the, your intention, has to be absolutely crystal clear Very about what you mean by that. And I have found again and again in my life that when I had a very strong intention about something, the clearer the intention was, two things would happen. First of all, it would happen. But the faster it would happen was related to how clear it was. So very clear intention, I need this for what I'm doing, just seems to appear. So the flip side of all this is sometimes, if you, if you look at a grimoire, which is a book of spells, used in traditional magic, a huge section of that is going to be on love magic. So it's to find somebody for love, for sex, for a relationship, whatever. That is a gray area because if you override the free will of somebody else, that's considered black magic. Yes. Black magic is considered not a very good thing because of something like karma. That you, you override somebody else's free will, you are opening a door that you don't want to go through. So this is like every tradition has this same warning. So be very careful then in using your intention so that you are not overriding somebody else's free will. That's mm. like, that's rule number one. Or causing harm to somebody else. So a gray area here that is a very, a really interesting one from an ethical point of view is, what if you want to stop somebody else from hurting somebody else? Well, you're overriding that person's free will because they're going to do whatever they're going to do. But if they're a bad person, and they're going to hurt somebody else, the way that the magical traditions deal with this is to create a binding spell. It has lots of different names to it, but the binding spell essentially is a an intention that the person will not produce harm to another person. Hmm. And it's a gray area because you are interfering with them, but in a good way. That's why from an ethical perspective, it's it's interesting to discuss, well, should you do that or not? I don't know, probably case by case, you have to decide, is this worth doing? And, and like, you have to eat the karma from that or not? So I don't have yeah. any simple answer to that, but yeah. that is that is a consideration. What would light magic look like in, in this case? Generally, things like healing. Hmm. Somebody is in need, gives you permission to heal them, because you don't want to, like if somebody doesn't ask for your help, you should not give it to them because that will maybe, it might be overriding their intention. Like uh, some people say, I don't want, don't deal with me at all. So don't do that. But if they're asking for help, then healing definitely is tradition of white magic because you're helping. Uh, Or if it's simply that you're looking for information, like you want to make a decision about something and it, it may or may not involve other people, but all you're asking for is information, that's okay as well. From the Western culture, magic consists of divination, knowing things about what's happening out there, force of will, which otherwise we thought it was psychokinetic effects, it's spell casting and so on, and then theurgy, which has to do with spirits, because all of the esoteric traditions assume that there are some kind of non-physical spirits out there. In the Eastern tradition, uh, the the same powers are th- are thought about slightly differently, but they're called siddhis, which is a Sanskrit term that means essentially power. It's the same kind of idea. Sometimes it could be translated as attainment, like special attainment, but uh, it ultimately about different psychic abilities. So. The Yoga Sutras is considered the classical book of yoga at least 2,000 years ago, but it was part of an oral tradition that goes back so far. We don't really know where it started from. And it was all about a uh, methods of meditation and deep states of mind, which they would call samadhi, which a magician would call gnosis. It's the same underlying deep mental state. That's where the magic comes from. That's where the the cities come from, these deep mental states, which are generally in most people nowhere near a conscious level. 
It, it takes a lot of meditative experience or certain psychedelics to be able to drop into those states. So it's a non-ordinary state of awareness. The, the upshot is that from those deep states, it seems as though the difference between mind and matter or everyday reality and some underlying sense of reality is much more flexible than it is in your conscious awareness. So in the conscious awareness states, I want to levitate, not happening. In these deep states, it would happen because you're able to manipulate elements of reality that we, we don't have access to at this level of awareness. So there's roughly 25 different kinds of cities that are mentioned in these ancient texts. The most elementary ones are, like the very first one that is mentioned, is the ability to perceive past, present, and future all at the same time. So today we'd call it somewhere between clairvoyance and precognition. And it goes all the way up to levitation, to invisibility, to super strength, to almost everything that you've seen in a comic book. Hmm. But this was written thousands of years ago, not as a story, but as this will happen in these states. So from a modern perspective, you look back at that and say, well, this is so much like seeing a, a superhero movie that that can't possibly be true. But there are historical cases of people levitating and doing all kinds of strange things that are mildly credible. We don't see those today in the laboratory. Like we have never seen anybody actually levitate. I'd love to. So the, the idea is, so how do we evaluate the Yoga Sutras, given that it was so long ago? And the, the only way I can think of doing it then is saying, well, here's 25 or so different kinds of powers, simple elementary powers that many beginning meditators bump into are things like synchronicities and telepathy and clairvoyance and so on. We know those are real using modern scientific methods. So then the question would arise, well, if we know that roughly six to 10 of these 25 powers are real, were they simply making up the rest of them? I don't think so. I think that actually part of this lore that's been going on for probably tens of thousands of years, that people, probably a very small percentage of people, but some people can actually do those things. People who have those abilities are very likely not to want to be known for being for having those abilities because they will immediately attract followers that they don't want and they probably will put themselves and people they know in danger, right? Especially in the modern world, anybody who has that level of power will become a threat. There will be people out there who want to get the threat to go away. And so someone with that level of skill almost certainly will remain <laughs> invisible. So remote viewing is a modern euphemism for clairvoyance. So perception through space and time. Mm. That's what the Stargate program was all about. And by the way, that was one code word of many different code words that were used over the years. Uh, the idea was uh, if someone really can perceive through space and time, it might be useful for espionage. And that's what that project was about. So there's two sides. One was a research program, which is what I was on. The other was an operational program that was part of the army unit. So there were people who were recruited to be remote viewers. Some of them were naturally good. So others were interested and turned out that they could be trained. And they were given, I forget how many, 500, 600 different missions where their job was to use the remote viewing skills to give information to the intelligence community that would use the information as one piece of information along with lots of other pieces of information. So in the intel business, you use satellites, you use human intelligence, you use everything you can think of to pull in information about a given event or thing that you want to know about. And then the analysts will kind of put it all together into a package. So I don't know of any cases where the psychic information was used only by itself. It was used as a composite. But sometimes the information was so unexpected that the analyst didn't know what to do with it. And it turned out to be true. Mm -hmm. So it turns out some people are quite talented at this. We had heard about, saw a couple of movies of people who were to, able to do small scale psychokinetic things. But by far, it was much, much easier to find people who are talented in clairvoyance. And that so you think about what, what percentage of the population will have these skills. So something like one in 10,000 people will be quite good just naturally at clairvoyance or be able to be trained somewhat. And maybe one in a million or fewer will have some kind of psychokinetic talent. So, you know, if you, if you have millions of people in the army, you can do wide scale searching for people and recruit them and then keep sifting down candidates until you end up with a small number who are very good at what they do. 